Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, uh, coming to you from the tail end of what has been a fairly difficult and confronting week for people um, interested in maritime history and the maritime world as a whole. This week we had two pretty shocking pieces of news. The first was that a um, vessel off of Greece had capsized, carrying hundreds of people on board with hundreds of lives uh, lost. The second piece of news was that, of course, the Ocean Gate submersible vessel Titan had disappeared. It's obviously impossible not to compare the um, scope and tragedy of the two um, two disasters, and there's been a lot of talk about that on the internet. The purpose of this video is to look at some of the techniques involved in locating the wreck of Titan. And there's been a few more developments actually since I wrote the um, the, the points for the script of this video. So I, at certain points we, at certain points I'll be going off um, script to explain. But I thought you might be interested in some of the techniques and some of the technologies involved in actually locating the wreck because this week there's been a lot of words being thrown around: sonar, radar, um, sono buoys, sono boys, you know that kind of thing. So I thought I'd explain some of it for you and just look at the technical aspects. We're not going to be going into a lot of conjecture because, as always, the internet has been full of conjecture and, and misinformation. Of course, the submersible was lost with five people on board, including somebody who was a personal hero of mine and many within the Ocean Liner community. Paul-Henri Nargiolet, PH as he was known, a giant in his field and just an absolute legend. So, yeah, it's been it's been pretty tough. And... I don't think the Ocean Liner and Titanic community is particularly big, so it feels a little bit like we've lost uh, some family here. And uh, yeah, I think we're all all very sad. I avoided making this or any video for about a week or so as the events have uh, unfolded, but I feel like now I've got some more input and can speak to some of the more technical parts of the situation, which is more in uh, the character of the channel. So I'm going to split this video up into a couple of parts. First, I'll explain why companies like Oceangate even dive to the Titanic in the first place. Then we'll look at the submersible Titan itself and how it was built. And then finally, the techniques that have been used and the immense challenges inherent in the epic search for the submarine. So first of all, why do we dive the wreck of the Titanic? Why do we continue to do so? The Titanic's wreck was found back in, in 1985 by Dr. Robert Ballard and his, and his team. She's resting um, almost four kilometers down at something like 12,500 feet in absolutely crushing, crushing depth. And since then, there have been dozens of dives out to the wreck of Titanic in, in all different kinds of submersibles, the most famous probably being Alvin, uh, owned by the US Navy and operated by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It's been in service since 1964. Alvin's got 5,000 dives under its belt, and it's still in service today. The two Mir submarines, uh, James Cameron used those quite extensively. You've seen them. If you've watched the movie Titanic, you've seen those. Um, tried and true, brilliant craft. Just recently laid up, but could probably still work just fine. You know, just a month ago, we made a video on this channel about the really exciting things that were being done by Magellan and Atlantic Productions in scanning the Titanic wreck and taking photographs of it and turning that into a photogrammetry model. So... There's still clearly a lot of interest in the Titanic, and I feel like a lot of this is being mischaracterized as some kind of um, just millionaire's folly that they're just running to, you know, they call it the tourist submarine experience, which is uh, just not true. Ocean Gate is a legitimate scientific research organization. It's privately funded. The CEO was Mr. Stockton Rush, who was um, in the uh, casualty list, who was lost in the submersible. The primary stated goal of Ocean Gate is to examine the Titanic for two reasons, predominantly for science. So the Titanic wreck is interesting because it rests on the sea floor in what is essentially an underwater desert. It's not flat. There are mountains about as tall as those that we have on the surface here, like Mount Everest, for example. There are basins. Titanic itself rests in like kind of like a valley between all these big um, mountainous ranges underwater but because it's so deep there's not a, a wide variety of life all over the place like you'd see on a coral reef for example there's sparse pieces here and there you kind of have to know what you're looking for the titanic by sheer nature of it being so big has now turned into something like a, a bit of an oasis you know in this desert now there's 
hundreds and hundreds of species of not only animals like you know rat tail fish and things like that, but also microbes that were previously unknown to science. And they actually named one after Titanic. It was discovered as late as 2010 and it was uh, called Halomonas Titanicae. So we're still learning things about our planet. And the whole point of Ocean Gate was to use the Titanic as an opportunity to teach the world about things that we didn't know about the oceans. You know, very famously, they say that we know probably more about space than we do about the bottom of the ocean. To fund this venture, OceanGate also allowed for civilians to come along and receive some minimal training as um, mission specialists and just kind of go down on the dives. But to my knowledge, they weren't running dives purely for tourist reasons, just for people to go and sightsee. These were scientific expeditionary dives. They were capturing capturing data points, and then they would have civilians along to to fund it. So we dive the Titanic to learn about the science, to learn about our our world, things we don't know, and also to learn about the history. You know, Titanic has been shrouded in um, mystery and intrigue and total misinformation. So, you know, reviewing it, keeping the historical record straight, OceanGate has got us some of the most incredible um, footage of the Titanic and unbelievable quality that would have been unthinkable, you know, decades ago that's just, you know, in the last couple of years was front page news. But the the actual mission statement of Ocean Gate was was a legitimate scientific scientific one. So that's why we dive the Titanic. The Titanic is kind of like the sugar that sweetens the medicine, as it were. I use it on my channel. If you watch any of my videos, like the one I did the other week about how did they navigate Titanic, well, congratulations, because now you understand how almost every other ship from that era navigated, because Titanic used the same stuff. So you put it in the context of Titanic, People will click, people are interested in it, and people will learn a lot. So let's talk about the submersible Titan. Why is it not a submarine? Um, this is a semantic thing, but a submersible is a vehicle that can submerge, but is predominantly reliant on exterior support. So in the case of Titan, um, she was not tethered to the mothership, but relied on navigational inputs and things like that. A submarine is almost a completely self-independent vehicle that, that wouldn't need exterior support to operate or function correctly. So that's the difference between the two, and that's why Titan is more correctly referred to as a submersible, but of course the terms are being used interchangeably, so I'm not, I'm not a pedant about using the right terms. So if I alternate between submersible and submarine, please forgive me. The guiding philosophy around Titan's design and construction was simplicity. We've seen the news make a huge deal out of the fact that a um, simple games controller, a Logitech Bluetooth controller was used to control the submarine. Um, this doesn't smack of uh, last minute unpreparedness or cheapness. This is almost kind of becoming standard practice. The US Navy, for example, uh, the submarine USS Colorado has employed almost identical controllers for operating um, the subs weapons, some of the weapon systems to operate the photonic masts, which essentially replace the, the periscope in a submarine. So it's easy, it's intuitive. And it's simple and it's try it is tried and true. You know, these are OEM parts. They are off the shelf, but they're off the shelf because they are tried and true and you, you can use them. Now, how was Titan built and what made it unique? Well, recently many experts have come forward claiming that they were concerned about the way the submersible was designed and constructed. So let's look at why and how Titan was a departure from traditional deep sea submersible design. First, I need to introduce you to Alvin. Alvin is a research deep sea submersible first introduced in 1964 with around 5,000 dives under its belt, and it's still in service today. Most deep sea submersibles follow Alvin's pattern of design. At its core, if you strip away all the surface level exterior stuff, the submersible is built around this crew compartment called the pressure vessel. Everything outside of this compartment is simply equipment which by themselves don't need protection from the crushing water pressure at depth, but everything inside the pressure vessel must be protected, including the crew. So the pressure vessel has to be able to stand up to the insane conditions. In the case of the Titanic wreck site, the pressure is about 400 times that on the surface, or the equivalent of 6,000 pounds per square inch, or three tons of pressure per square inch. To survive this kind of insane force, the Alvin's pressure vessel is a special shape. It's a sphere, a ball, made out of titanium, which is itself an immensely strong metal, with a wall thickness of about two inches or five centimeters. This is important, so I'm going to keep it here on screen. The pressure vessel can fit three crew and their equipment. But why is the pressure vessel in the shape of a ball? 
While a sphere is extremely good at uniformly distributing the pressures of deep water, being perfectly round, there are virtually no weak spots where pressures can focus and build up. The entire structure reinforces itself. Now let's look at Titan. Beneath the superficial panelling on the outside, the submersible was also built around a pressure vessel. But this one was not in the shape of a ball, but a cylinder. Why the departure from tried and true engineering? Well, this could be linked to Ocean Gate's business model, taking civilian backers as mission crew to help fund the research. For this, Titan would simply need to carry more people. You could try and cram five into a sphere, but you'd need to make it larger than Alvin's pressure vessel, and the bigger the sphere gets, the weaker it is, so then the walls would need to be made thicker, but then you've added a lot of extra weight. Remember, the sub still needs to be able to power itself along underwater and even be plucked from the ocean at the end of the mission, so it can't be too heavy. Instead, Titan would employ a long cylindrical pressure vessel that could fit five, which was two more people than Alvin. So how do you make a cylinder able to withstand the pressures of the ocean? Well, Ocean Gate decided to use carbon fibre to create the cylindrical pressure vessel. And this is an actual video of them making the pressure vessel. This was a wound carbon fibre hull where they literally wound strands of carbon fibre over a cylinder until the desired wall thickness was achieved. That wall thickness? A whopping 12.7 centimetres or 7 inches. Now, this is a huge jump on Alvin's 2 inches because the cylindrical pressure vessel was much bigger and its shape was possibly not as adept at evenly distributing the compressive forces at depth, so the wall simply had to be thicker. So now you have a carbon fibre tube that needs to be made watertight. So the carbon fibre was capped at either end with titanium rings, which would be used to then attach the hemisphere end pieces, which were also very heavily reinforced made out of titanium. After the carbon fibre pressure vessel was formed, the titanium rings were bonded to it at either end. So the exact method of bonding is a mystery to me, but articles online from when this was done in 2017 focus on tight engineering tolerances and a high amount of precision. And then to these rings could be bolted the heavy-duty end hemispheres, one of which featured an acrylic viewing porthole which was about 7 inches thick. Now, let's talk about possible points of failure for both designs. Naturally, hatches and portholes might be seen as weak points, but they actually aren't. They use water pressure to their benefit. Alvin has a single crew hatch on top of the pressure vessel. You'd think that this might be a weak point, but the water pressure acting on the submersible from the outside actually presses in on the hatch, making the seal even more watertight. The same is true of the portholes. They're small, round, and extremely thick, good at distributing pressure, and they're pressed in against the pressure vessel, creating a watertight seal. Remember when I mentioned that a sphere is adept at distributing pressures? There are no obvious places for pressure to build up. Right angles are the worst for this. The infamous de Havilland Comet was a jet airliner that suffered a series of explosive decompressions because pressure built up in the corner of its square windows and tore the aircraft's skin. Now aircraft windows are rounded so that they evenly distribute the stress. It's the same principle. Titan had a couple of right angles, most obviously at either end of the pressure vessel where the end domes met the rings. But remember, the water pressure would be acting on these from the outside to make the seal even more watertight. Much has been made by the media about Stockton Rush, Ocean Gate's CEO, talking about how the porthole would be, quote, squeezed in by the water. But now you know he was probably referring to the pressure which was used to the submersible's benefit at depth to create even tighter seals. Instead, areas of concern around Titan focus on the materials. Wound carbon fibre is not like titanium. It's made up of layers of the material wound atop one another and essentially cured into place. After dozens of dive cycles and pressurizations, and remember, at this point, the submersible is about five or six years old, the fear is that the material might be susceptible to delamination, where the individual layers may separate. On top of that, there are two points in Titan where different materials in the pressure vessel meet, at either end where the carbon fiber hull is bonded to the titanium rings. The guiding philosophy of submersible design is to avoid introducing potential points of failure, especially on the pressure vessel where different materials meet. But here, Titan may have featured around two or three weaknesses relating purely to its material construction. This is why many in the deep dive community were questioning carbon fibre as a pressure hull material. It was simply experimental 
and under-evaluated. Titan was the largest wound pressure vessel yet constructed, and the first one to ever be employed to dive the Titanic. So now with some understanding of the Titan's construction and its potential weaknesses, let's look at what we know has been found in the debris of the wreck. So some of the first pieces of debris to be found were the exterior tail cone, which is not part of the pressure vessel, along with some of the still framing for the landing skids, but this was followed by the bow and stern titanium hemispheres from the pressure vessel. Whether or not these are still connected to the titanium end rings is yet to be seen, but presumably fragments of the carbon fibre pressure hull have also been found. So that's a bit of a look at how Titan was built, why some were concerned about its construction. I want to avoid conjecture too much, so I'm not going to go into where I think the, you know, the point of failure might have been. That will be ascertained in time, but that's a bit more of a detailed look at how this thing was actually built. So we know how she was made and what's been found so far, but now let's look at the incredible techniques and technologies that were actually used in the hunt to find the submersible. Essentially, in a normal dive, Titan and submersibles just like her would select a point that was um, far enough away from the Titanic wreck that they weren't really at risk of um, dropping directly on top of it, because that could be catastrophically bad, obviously. So they would descend in essentially a free fall at a rate of around about two to four kilometers per hour, averaging about three. And they would do so in, in almost um, a powered down state, essentially. The non-crucial electronic equipment is essentially on standby because you don't need power. It's a two hour drop and the submarine is just essentially falling for, for three or four kilometers. So the crew turn off a lot of systems they don't need and, and kind of just hang out. <laughs> Some fell asleep in previous expeditions. And then on approach to the seabed, the submersible would begin to power up those crucial systems like, like the engines and things like that. So when reaching the seafloor, they could come to a gentle rest. The thrusters are powered up and they can then start making their way towards the wreck of Titanic to have a look. Typically, the bow is the most iconic. It's the most easy rallying point for for easy navigation towards. And in Titan's case, the submersible actually relied on um, signals from the mothership uh, to navigate, which people again have made a lot of, but it's, um, you know, it's a different way of doing things. The design philosophy for this vessel was simplicity. Um, why would you need to load a submersible up with, you know, a, a lot of navigational equipment when now we could rely on other communication systems to to essentially guide the submersible from the surface. You know, it's a, just a different design philosophy. At a certain point, and this is interesting um, because it's kind of coming from people like uh, Bob Ballard, who found Titanic back in 85, James Cameron, and people in the know. There was a catastrophic implosion of the, of the vessel when the hull was breached, that, that woven carbon fibre hull obviously was breached at a certain point. And it seems that they were aware of the situation because the submersible had an acoustic uh, system that was essentially designed to tell if the hull of the vessel was under stress from sounds it was making and would then essentially sound an alarm saying, you've got a problem. Bob Ballard, James Cameron are indicating that the submersible dropped its ballast weight in an attempt to emergency surface, but didn't make it, and the hull was compromised, and the vessel was destroyed because of it. We know that now. The Navy knew it then, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute, but the information wasn't made publicly available until until just now. Now, obviously, for, for quite some time, for the last few days, the search was being treated as a search and rescue, and people were fixated on the idea of, you know, there not being enough oxygen to support four or five days underwater. So... We understand what has happened to Titan with some degree of clarity and certainty. What I really want to talk about is the technology and the techniques that they use to hunt for the submersible, because it's it's really fascinating stuff and and um, more in, f in tune with what this channel is about, which is how technology works. So for the search teams involved, uh, they had a suite of technologies at their hands, at their disposals to, to search for the for the missing submersible. And these mainly relied on um, information about where the submersible was. So the first piece of technology, your eyes, 
binoculars visual sighting on the surface. The submersible was fitted with a number of fail-safes that in the event of, a, of an emergency, she could emergency surface. And then it would be a case of spotting visually the, the submarine. So you had um, aircraft, United States Coast Guard, um, Canadian aircraft scouring the sea surface to visually make contact with, with the submersible, but also to employ radar. Now, essentially, radar is pretty common practice for identifying contacts or, or vehicles on the surface. It relies on a transmitter that fires out radio beams into the atmosphere. And then if those beams hit a solid object, especially metal or things like that, the beams are reflected off in all different directions and some bounce back at the, uh, the radar installation. And from that, you can essentially get a picture of if there is something out there. It's called, you can get a radar contact. And it's especially useful for seeing big things like ships and, and, and you know, large objects. But Titan was a fairly small craft, not too much bigger than a family car. And sitting half submerged, say bobbing on the surface, a lot of her would be still in the water and it may not be a very um, easily distinguished radar contact. Now these are moot points now because we know the submarine was actually below the surface, but there were aircraft and ships employing those kinds of visual and radar contact style strategies to locate the submarine on the surface. But how do you search for a submersible underwater? This is a really interesting bit of, bit of um, history and engineering and technology. The primary tool for looking underwater is actually sound. Sound travels very, very far underwater. And they actually knew this back in Titanic's day. I made a video the other week talking about the navigational equipment on board Titanic. And one of these was a very little known device called the submarine signaler. And there were essentially two microphones placed in Titanic's hull that could be used to listen for sounds underwater, bells that were mounted to um, floating buoys near jagged shorelines or in fog that could essentially just be listened to like you were listening to a telephone and direct the ship away from that, that danger and that hazard. Navigating or searching for things with acoustics is not new uh, technology, but it has been perfected. Sonar is the technology of choice for using sound underwater to find things. There are two kinds, two main kinds of sonar. The first is passive sonar. Now this is essentially just listening to the sounds of the ocean, for, for want of a better term, listening in, trying to hear things that are man-made and distinguish between what could be a pot of whales and what could be, say, the propeller from a ship. Now, we've all heard a lot about tapping sounds, supposed tapping sounds that were coming um, from the submersible or were, were picked up or heard by, by uh, Navy vessels or Coast Guard vessels. Passive sonar would be the, the technology that they would use. Essentially, these are um, receivers that can detect sounds that simply travel through water a long distance. There are two kinds of passive sonar. There's wideband and narrowband. And essentially wideband is like casting a wide net and getting a rough bearing on. You hear a sound and, and that kind of gives you an, maybe an idea of where something is and, and in what direction roughly, or if it's coming towards you or what have you. Narrowband is like taking a microscope to that sound, splitting it apart and looking at all the different frequencies in that, say, recording of sound because boat propellers and dolphin pods and whales and, and tectonic activity. All these different things make sounds at different frequencies. And you can essentially split the sound apart and pick out, okay, that is a boat. That is a whale. We don't know what that is. Canadian aircraft and search and rescue aircraft are flying around dropping sono boys into the water that they can use to essentially listen for any sounds. And of course, one of the easy ways for a submarine or submersible crew who are trapped down below still alive in their craft without communication to the outside world to signal where they are is to simply wrap on the side of the, the hull of their submarine. The sound will travel through the water and it will be heard. The secret to this is not to constantly knock because that can get lost in this huge soundscape that is the ocean. The ocean is very loud, surprisingly loud. Not only that, but sono boys or passive sonar listeners from a distance 
are essentially listening to, imagine if you were standing in a canyon yelling and that sound is traveling and traveling and traveling and becoming distorted and warped. You need to listen very carefully to what is being said. It helps if the message that is being sent is simple, concise, and easily determinable as to what it actually is. So for that specific purpose, submarine and submersible crews are trained to tap out around about three minutes every half an hour. That kind of messaging from below is, is very clearly a deliberate attempt at uh, making contact with the outside world. It's, it's regular. It's at intervals that are perfectly timed. And it will cut through the noise because it, it, go, it happens and then it stops as opposed to continual sound that could just get lost. So that kind of tapping would be picked up by passive sonar. There was obviously some news about this, about supposed sounds. Um, that does now seem to not have been um, the case, but some of the um, crew on the submersible would have been trained in wrapping on the side of the hull to, to that kind of rhythm to establish contact with the outside world and reach sono boys or, or passive um, sonar listeners. Disturbingly, <clears throat> the United States Navy um, heard the implosion of the submersible the day it went missing, pretty much the minute that communications with the outside world were, were actually lost. And they immediately reported that to the incident um, commander. The way they heard that is that the United States government actually has a um, quite secret installation of essentially passive sonar listening devices all over the ocean there that are, <laughs> they were originally installed during the Cold War to listen for Soviet submarines. They are fine-tuned and powerful enough that they can hear sounds like um, seismological activity, undersea earthquakes. They detected, um, they heard with their passive sonar, they actually heard the Titan's uh, implosion. They knew about it and they told the um, incident controller. And so search teams were able to use that information to essentially zero in on where Titan was. Now, finally, we come to the second type of sonar. We've looked at passive sonar. The other type that could be used to locate a missing submarine or submersible is active sonar. Now, I am sure that from movies or cartoons, a lot of you would be familiar with this sound. Back in the day, active sonar was used by uh, destroyers to essentially see underwater and look out for enemy submarines and chase them down and destroy them. The way it works, unlike with passive sonar, passive sonar is essentially just listening to the ocean, active sonar involves sending a signal out into the ocean and waiting for those, those sound waves to bounce back. And that feedback, once they return to the, the sonar installation, can give you information on how far away the object is, for example, that the sound bounced off of, what shape it is, how big it is, that kind of thing. Now, this is called a, a sonar ping, and it is essentially in its basic, basic form, a very, very, very loud sound that is made by the, essentially like the transmitter, we'll say, of the active sonar installation that is just fired off underwater. And this can really startle anything in its path, especially animals and divers. Um, this is an amazing piece of footage. It has been uh, very kindly provided by the diver, Jim Ryan. Listen to this sonar ping from a nearby US Navy vessel while Jim was just diving and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's that loud and you can kind of hear it pinging off into the distance and echoing as it goes through the ocean. It's a good demonstration of how sound itself just travels underwater. Active sonar is a lot more advanced than it was back in the day during World War II when submarine sonar and, and destroyer sonar sounded like this. A single note, single frequency that can give you very, very limited information. Now they sound like this. Multiple tones, multiple frequencies, and 
dozens of pings per second even that can be used to map a very complex image of what objects are below a ship. So complex modern active sonar can be used to literally create a visual map of an environment. This is called sonar imaging. And ironically, it's been used to great effect to map the Titanic wreck site in exquisite detail. Active sonar could be used to find, say, a vehicle like Titan resting on the, on the sea floor. It would appear as a, as a blip. Not a very big blip, but it would appear as a visual blip. Modern computers can take the active sonar's data and turn it into a, a visual, visual map and, and show you a 3D model, essentially, or a 3D scan of what is down there. Modern side scanning sonar would be able to map the seafloor and potentially find an object the size of Titan. Titan's not very big, but in theory, um, active sonar could have spotted Titan on the seafloor. Now, some of the issues surrounding this are actually to do with Titanic herself. Um, the Titanic wreck is not in one piece. The ship very famously, when she sank, broke apart at the surface, spilling hundreds and thousands of objects and pieces of wreckage all over the seafloor. Were a submersible like Titan to come to rest in the debris field, um, a active sonar scan of the debris field wouldn't reveal it, but then it would be essentially like playing a game of spot the difference with an older scan of the wreck um, of the debris field to see what new specs about the size of Titan had appeared. The even worst case scenario, and uh, I'll be honest, this I kind of thought this might have been the reality of the situation earlier this week, is that there are pieces of Titanic down there that are monumental. Here is my drawing of the Titanic's wreck, as it would have appeared the morning after the sinking, but to give you an idea of the size. That's the Titanic's bow section. And here is the Titan to scale. As you can see, a pretty significant size difference. So there are pieces of Titanic down there that tower over Titan. There are three story tall chunks of Titanic superstructure just jutting out of the silt. There are hundreds and hundreds of pieces bigger than Titan that could shroud it, that could hide the submersible's hull from an active sonar scan and they would never see it. Were the submersible to land in an empty area, a relatively empty area, it would be easier to, to find. Were it to land in a debris field, it may be impossible to locate. And I genuinely thought that the submersible may never be seen again. I don't say any of this to be uh, dramatic. We know now, like I said earlier, what happened to the submersible. But I just wanted to give you a bit of an insight into these techniques and technologies that were used to locate the wreck. In the end, now we have a much clearer understanding of what happened, that the, the hull failed and the submarine was, was destroyed, and so the wreckage has been located. But truthfully, at the time of writing this, this script, uh, the submersible was nowhere to be found. And I genuinely thought that it might hide somewhere down there in the, in the sonar shadow of a much bigger object. But yeah, I hope this has been interesting. I didn't feel comfortable making a video until we you know, had a bit more certainty over what, what is happening. But hopefully this will help you kind of cut through the noise of some of the, the words that were being thrown around this week. You should have a decent understanding now of radar, sonar, the two types of sonar, and how they were used interchangeably and together to, to try to search for the submersible Titan when it was missing. I hope this video was interesting or uh, informative at the very least. Let me know what you thought um, down in the comments as always. Hopefully next week we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming. But until then, as always, stay safe and stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.